Good afternoon, everybody. As you know, Secretary Pompeo will host the second ministerial to advance religious freedom next week, July 16th through 18th, here at the State Department. This year's event will be bigger, broader, and better than last year's groundbreaking event. The continuing and complex challenges to religious freedom demand an even greater stage, with more stakeholders working together to identify solutions. I'd like to introduce someone that is very familiar to all of you, Ambassador Brownback, the Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Ambassador Brownback will provide a brief overview for this year's MARF priorities, and we'll take a few MARF-related questions at the end of his remarks. We will then continue with our normal press briefing. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. <clears throat> Thanks, Maureen. Appreciate that. And thank you all for uh, being here today. As she outlined the event, uh, this year's event will be the biggest religious freedom event ever held in the world. Uh, there's never been one as big nor like it. Uh, we'll have at the, uh, it's really two events. The first two days will be religious actors and civil society people gathering here. It'll be over a thousand. We've had over a thousand RSVPs uh, accepting. Uh, th day three is countries coming uh, to state their actions and the things that they hope to do in this religious freedom space. Uh, we've had uh, a number invited and we have more foreign ministers that have accepted this year uh, than were here last year at the event. Um, we will highlight the people that have been persecuted. Uh, last year's event, as you, some of you may recall if you were around for it, we had a number of survivors of religious persecution that kicked off each of the sessions. This year we'll have over 20 survivors of religious persecution will be speaking. Uh, they'll represent many faiths. We'll start off, the first panel will be uh, a group from the Abrahamic faiths. We'll have a um, Jewish rabbi from the San Diego synagogue uh, shooting will be here. We'll have a Christian from the Sri Lankan Easter bombings will be next speaking. Uh, and then a Muslim from the New Zealand mosque attacks. Uh, we'll be back to back to back will be the presentations uh, of these each horrific events that took place, but really trying to state to the world these things are going on and they need to stop uh, and actions need to be taken. Uh, and that will be the start. The, both, the, the best known of the people persecuted they will be here speaking will be uh, Nadia Murad. Uh, Nadia, as many of you uh, know, is a Yazidi, Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, for her advocacy on behalf of the Yazidis in northern Iraq and the genocide uh, that took place against Christians and Yazidis there. And Andrew Brunson uh, also will be here, a pastor uh, from the United States that was held in a Turkish prison uh, for two years. We hope that this will stir actions. Uh, that's what we're after, is to stir action. Uh, what we hope to see are a number of, uh, and some of these are specific actions, but religious freedom roundtables start up around the world where various religious actors and civil society uh, people in various countries would come together and stand for each other's religious freedom. Uh, so that these faiths will all, all come together and do that. We've got about 10 of these roundtables started around the world. I meet with the one that's here every Tuesday that I'm in town. Uh, we hope to see a number of them started around the world as, as activists. Uh, we hope follow on meetings in various regions. We had three last year. Uh, one in Great Britain, one in UAE, uh, one in Taiwan. We hope for a series of follow-on regional summits uh, from this one. And then really, ultimately, we're after a grassroots movement. Uh, I was a part of the early uh, human trafficking effort uh, for this country, uh, and it's been very pleasing to me to see this now evolve into a grassroots movement where there's lots of different efforts in many places around the world to stop human trafficking. Unfortunately, human trafficking still goes on, but there's lots of grassroots efforts to push back. We want one in the religious freedom space uh, as well, and that, uh, that the religious actors would stand up for each other. We anticipate uh, at day three uh, of the governments together announcements by the United States and a number of other countries of specific actions that would follow on. Uh, for your note and maybe interest as well, I hope uh, there will be 80 Eight zero sidebar events taking place. Uh, and these are activists uh, from this country and many other countries that will be hosting events that will go on in the margins or the sideline of this uh, overall event. And they'll be all over the uh, table for as far as uh, different groups and different uh, items that they'll be putting forward. If you're interested in any of those, you can go to irfroundtable.org 
uh, and see where all of those are and, and kind of a listing of those and if there's any that would be of interest to you. Again, that site is irfroundtable.org. Uh, because the interest is so high and we're maxed out, we had to close registration two weeks ago, there's going to be a second stage operated uh, that will run parallel to this one at the GW University. Of course, it's just up the street uh, here at the Loeb Institute is hosting that along with a youth track. So while we've got the stage going here and we couldn't accommodate everybody, uh, they will operate a second stage uh, there of, of a number of speakers uh, there as well. That's again at GW University, the Loeb Institute. The entire event will start Monday, July 15th at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, we are going there uh, with the survivors that will be speaking, the group of survivors. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a solemn uh, place uh, that reminds us of never again, and yet you still get people persecuted for their faith. Uh, last year's kickoff event at the, at the Holocaust Museum was a really a profound, uh, profound event. I remember talking with one individual that had experience, and they look at a picture from the Holocaust, uh, and they see a uniform uh, uh, that was the like, uh, like the one they were in. Uh, here was a modern survivor of religious persecution seeing a uniform like the, the, one of the people that were in the Holocaust. And then he just said, that's the kind of uniform I was in. Uh, and then another person said that evil is just not very imaginative. It just keeps repeating the same thing. Uh, and that's an unfortunate truth when we have the level of religious persecution, a number of people being killed around the world today uh, for their faith. We'll end at the African American Museum, a uh, reception there on Thursday evening. Uh, I'm delighted that, uh, the, that they're willing to host uh, the, uh, the final summation event uh, with their... So it'll be a full week of activities. We, uh, we hope you'll be interested in covering some of it. And, and this, is a, this is a big deal. It's a big deal to this administration, but it's a big deal to the people of the world. Uh, just the world has not paid enough attention to what's taking place here and the plight of so many people uh, that have been injured uh, and over 70 percent of the world lives in a religious restrictive environment and in many cases unfortunately a deadly uh, environment. So we hope to really push back and start this grassroots movement seriously to push back against it. We're going to be happy to take uh, questions for the, for the time you'd have. Thanks. Sir. Um, I'm just curious, in terms of participation, official part government participation in the, in the conference, uh, do you know, uh, can you say, are there going to be officials from governments of countries that you, uh, well, not you personally, but the, in the, that have been singled out by the administration, this administration or previous ones, for being countries of particular concern when it comes to um, religious freedom? In other words, the, uh, are the Chinese yes. going to be represented, or the, are the, uh, the the Turks, or the the Saudis, or the, those countries that have been right. that do, that have perhaps less than stellar records in this area? The the, the conference is centered around like-minded and aspirational countries. That's been our uh, model that we've gone for. So like-minded are ones that agree with us, and aspirational ones are ones that we hope are moving this way. There is a former CPC country that was invited last year that will be invited again this year, Uzbekistan. Uh, but here's a country that's been trying to move a positive direction, let 13,000 political and religious prisoners out of jail and has registered some churches and uh, done, a, you know, done a number of things. But uh, we, sadly, we don't have a lot of countries like that that are trying to be different uh, in this space. A number of them just continue to operate and if they're going to continue to operate that way we're going to continue to cite the problem that they are and the things that they're doing we hope it gets more costly to them uh, for them being on the outside of the global community stand for religious freedom um are there any are there any of these activists that have not been allowed to attend the conference from their own from their own countries meaning that their own countries are barring them from attending the conference? You know, not that I know of. Uh, we, we have, we always struggle with visas getting into the United States. I mean, right. getting visas, and that's been one of the bigger issues we've wrestled with. And there are people who, unfortunately, in this category are literally stateless, and it makes that even more complicated to get them here to get a visa when you're in a stateless situation, but we're trying to bring them here to show the world 
There are people that are pushed out of their country because of their faith, so they don't have a nation that, that they're a part of, uh, but they should be heard. And so uh, we're working, and I, I think we're going to be able to get them here. But I don't know of any that are being blocked by their own country. I could, if there is a correction on that, we'll try to get it to you. But I don't know of any. Okay, Sean. Uh, Follow up a little bit on Matt's question. Uh, in terms of the participation, you mentioned some foreign ministers. Yes. Uh, could you tell at this point, in terms of the participation that you find at, at that level, and at what level will other like-minded countries be represented? And do you expect some sort of joint de declaration at the end? What? Uh, what do you expect in terms of um, in terms of setting the agenda forward? Well, we had 24 minister level last year participants, uh, 19 foreign ministers, and then another series of ministers that there. Some countries have a minister of religion or uh, various areas that came. We have more registered than that this year of foreign ministers uh, that have that have stated they're coming. We're not putting a number out because. You don't know, okay, we, I'll tell you a number, and then somebody doesn't show because of the last minute, or we get a bunch more that are registering, which is what's taking place right now. But we have more registered foreign ministers uh, this year than came last year already. Um, and is that, and is that what was sure. the... And do you expect at the end some sort of uh, formal yes. joint statement of action? Yeah. Last year we put out the Potomac Declaration, which was a U.S. statement of here's where we're following on. We also put forward a series of statements of concern. Uh, and then we asked countries if they were interested in to sign on to these. We had, I think, eight of those last year. And a number of countries signed on to some, and it was kind of a smorgasbord. Some, I'll do this one, I'm not interested in that, don't want this one. Uh, and we'll do a similar process this year. We, we really, you know, what you'd like to do is to have kind of a big negotiated statement, uh, but there's just there's so many that we're inviting to it. And the, the statements of, the, the clarity of the position is really there in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which we'll have posted all over. That's, uh, you know, very clear on religious freedom. Uh, so it, it really now, it, we need to get this into the action level. We need to really push countries, hey, look, you signed up with the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and you're not doing this. Uh, it, it, this needs to change, and there needs to be global pressure uh, to cause this. Fain. Thank you. I just to understand the, the point that were raised. Uh, for instance, will there be representatives of the Rohingya uh, in the camps in Bangladesh and so on to present their viewpoint? On the other hand, will there be any representatives from the Myanmar government to talk to explain their the, own point of view? Uh, there will be Rohingya here. Uh, there will not be representatives of the Myanmar government invited. So they're not invited? Not invited. Okay. They, we wouldn't put them in either the category of like-minded or aspirational at this point in time. Okay. I hope that changes. Last question. Ambassador, you, you said you're hoping for a grassroots movement to, yes. to be generated after this. Is there a plan for the U.S. to support material or, or otherwise any movements that emerge in, in these countries? I couldn't. Uh, there, we'll see what comes out of it. Uh, the United States has been the forerunner in this space since this law creating this position was created 20 years ago. I say a forerunner in that the, the right was created long ago in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and it's been in our Constitution and in most constitutions for centuries or decades at least. Um, what hasn't taken place is the action to, to push it to happen. Uh, and that's the thing that I'm really hopeful that you'll see more of our action and other countries' actions to push. Now, whether that takes place, what form all that takes, uh, I think is really yet to be uh, yet to be seen, but um, this action is. Dead. You've got there's a British report out uh, last week. Uh, level of Christian persecution is um, highest ever in the world. Uh, they, their report was just on Christians, but you can go you can look, list any number of places and any number of faiths. Almost every faith that's a majority somewhere is a minority somewhere else and often gets persecuted where they're a minority. So that's why a big part of our effort is to get the faiths to come together and to stand for each other.
and to stand for each other's religious freedom. Not, we're not talking common theology here. Nobody agrees on theology. We're talking about a common human right that we're asking the faiths to come together and to stand for. And religion is often uh, upstream from politics. So we, we think if we really can get a number of the religious leaders coming together to stand for each other's religious freedom, no matter where they are, anywhere in the world, that that will really help us within the, uh, the governmental and the political community downstream from, from that thought. Okay. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Ambassador. Okay. I have a number of things for you today, so be patient with me here at the beginning. How's everyone doing? Is it still raining? No. Oh, oh, good. Okay. Um, first to Iran. The Department of State condemns the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy's attempt to unlawfully harass and interfere with the passage of the UK flagged merchant vessel British Heritage yesterday near the Strait of Hormuz. We commend the actions of the Royal Navy in ensuring freedom of navigation and the free flow of commerce through this critically important waterway. We will continue to work closely with the United Kingdom and our allies to ensure that Iran's regimes, uh, the Iranian regime's malign activities do not further disrupt international law, maritime security, or global commerce. Moving on to the South China Sea. Uh, tomorrow, July 12th, marks three years since a tribunal found that China's claim of historic rights in the South China Sea was unlawful. The tribunal's decision rejected China's nine-dash line maritime claim. The tribunal further made clear that drawing baselines around island groups in the South China Sea would be unlawful. Additionally, the tribunal found that China's activities relating to the construction of artificial islands and the practices of Chinese fishermen violated the Law of the Seas Convention requirements for the protection of the maritime environment. The tribunal's decision is final and legally binding on both parties subject to this arbitration, China and the Philippines. By advancing the peaceful settlement of these disputes, the decision is a victory for the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific. It is in the shared interest of the United States and other countries across the region to sustain the rules-based order so that each nation can reach its potential without sacrificing its national interest or its autonomy. China's militarization of disputed outposts in the South China Sea betrays President Xi's 2015 commitment not to engage in such activity. It is provocative, complicates the peaceful settlement of disputes, threatens the security of other nations, and undermines regional stability. We strongly oppose China's efforts to assert its unlawful maritime claims in the South China Sea. We urge all states to conform their maritime claims to international law as reflected in the Law of the Sea Convention and to resolve their territorial and maritime disputes peacefully and in accordance with international law. I would like to announce that Secretary General Louis Almagro and the Organization of American States will host a press conference tomorrow at 2.30 at the OAS to discuss the urgent and ongoing human rights crisis in Venezuela in light of continuing credible reports, including the recent UN OHCHR report that the former Maduro regime is engaged in systemic human rights abuses, including extrajudicial killings, torture, detention of political prisoners, and forced displacement to prop up his cumbering de facto hold on power. We will hear from Venezuelan expert Tamara Suju, former senior police official and escaped political prisoner Ivan Semenovos, and a special representative for Venezuela, Elliot Abrams. Ms. Suju has studied extensively how the secret police apparatus in Venezuela uses torture. Mr. Semenovos will tell his story as a political prisoner for more than 15 years. Their testimonies serve as a reminder that today in Venezuela, 614 people are political prisoners and are subject to violent physical and psychological torture, which, as we saw in the case of Naval Officer Acosta Aravelo, sometimes leads to death. No dictatorship lasts forever. Venezuela will soon be free, and those responsible for abuses and violation of human rights in Venezuela will be held accountable. We renew our calls for all nations to condemn the illegitimate Maduro regime and stand together to fight against its willful disregard for human rights. 
Free expression and an independent media are critical components of a vibrant, functioning democracy. That's why I brief. As a part of the United States' commitment to promoting the freedom of expression, we were proud to sign on to the Global Pledge on Media Freedom today at the Global Conference for Media Freedom in London. The pledge aims to increase global attention on media freedom and to increase the cost on those that attempt to undermine it. In too many countries, journalists face the threat of violence or imprisonment for their work. In 2018, civil society groups reported that at least 251 journalists remained in jail, with Turkey, China, and Egypt listed as the worst offenders. The United States calls to the release of journalists and media workers incarcerated throughout the world for their work, including in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, Vietnam, and Azerbaijan. We remain concerned by the disturbing trend of governments, uh, government efforts to unduly restrict access to information, including by shutting down the internet or independent media outlets, even for a limited time, in places such as in China, Venezuela, Sudan, Burma, Cameroon, and Mauritania. We are also concerned about the threats of violence against journalists, which have a chilling effect on press freedom, especially when they are not investigated or prosecuted. We call for an immediate end to threats and for violence against journalists, including in Russia and in Afghanistan. The United States believes everyone should be able to express themselves freely, both online and offline, and the media should be free to operate uh, should be able to operate free from harassment, threats, and violence. The United States will continue to work with partner governments, civil society, society, the media, and others to promote freedom of expression and to protect journalist safety. We will also continue to advocate for strong and transparent accountability for all of those who commit violence or other abuses against journalists. And then one more. It's your lucky day, Matthew Lee. On July 11th, the Department of State issued the 2019 Investment Climate Statements. These reports provide country-specific information on the business climates of more than 170 countries and economies and are prepared by our brilliant State Department economic officers assigned to embassies and posts around the world. They analyze a variety of economies that, economies that are or could be markets for U.S. businesses of all sizes. As Secretary Pompeo has said, helping American companies have the opportunity to succeed around the world by ensuring markets are open and breaking down the barriers is a cornerstone of economic diplomacy. The investment climate statements support this objective by highlighting reforms that level the playing field and informing U.S. businesses as they seek new markets. These statements highlight barriers that, if addressed, would support administration priorities such as expanding high-quality private sector-led investment in infrastructure, expanding women's economic empowerment, and facilitating a healthy business environment for the digital economy to benefit our companies and of the countries in which they do business. Okay. Matt, we Thank covered you. the world today. Yes, indeed. Uh, happy you. belated birthday. That's very nice. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, I one housekeeping, real quick housekeeping thing before I get to Iran, and that is uh -huh. on your um, South China Sea the statement. Yeah. What was that about 20 minutes ago or so? Uh, um, I could always what not is, brief. What, th this is the, uh, the this is the, the tribunal you're referring to is the Law of the Sea Tribunal, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. What's the administration's position on the Convention on the Law of the Sea? Do you think that the Senate should ratify it? Uh, so, I, un I know what you're getting at because we're not signed to it, but we, uh, you know, have, know. I'm sorry? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, so, we think that all parties that are a part of this have an obligation to comply with this uh, decision. They should, of course, um, exercise restraint. So, it's similar to the Iran nuclear deal. Even though you're not a part of it, the other parties oh, to it, including Iran, should still abide by it. Is that right? Yes? Okay. okay. What's your next question? The Iran question is, um, yesterday, your colleague, uh, Leah Gabriel, was on the Hill and testified uh, yeah. about the, uh, she was asked about the, the Iran disinfo uh, Twitter uh, feed, the project, and From she said May, that it right. had been terminated. Yes. And I'm just wondering, so I'm wondering if you can give a few more details on that. How much was the funding that has been terminated? And is there a review going on into other projects that the same uh, group, the same implementer, contractor, may have uh, What was that second part of the in. question, sorry? Are, are, are you guys looking at other projects that this contract, this outside party, had been, uh, ha, had done for you um, to mm. see if they're, to see if they, those projects 
didn't exceed or ex go beyond the scope of what they were supposed to be doing. So I think we briefed around the end of May, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it was May 29th, um, that the project had been suspended uh, following uh, some of those reports. Um, and, at this, and at that suspension date, the implementer was not permitted to uh, incur any new commitments. Um, and I believe Leah testified uh, yesterday that the process to uh, begin terminating the award began on July 1st. Uh, this was by mutual agreement. Uh, that process is ongoing because, of course, there's a technical process for termination, notification, funds, et cetera. Um, and so uh, in the meantime, the award remains completely suspended. In terms of if this uh, contractor has any uh, contracts with the State Department outside of the GEC, is that the question? No, it, within the GEC. Well, either within the GEC or outside the GEC. Yeah, I, I will have to double check with the GEC, but my understanding is that is that there any contract with the GEC has been uh, terminated. All right, and do you have a dollar figure for how much? Uh, I don't. Let, let me Good. see if that's something that, that we can that we can give get? out. Right. Yeah, but um, but again, my understanding was that 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 it was suspended May 29th. The termination process by mutual agreement started on July 1st. Thank okay, you, Sean. Uh, could I follow up on the readout that he had this morning of the <clears throat> phone call between the secretary and the South Korean foreign minister? Yeah, um, give me a second to find sure. that one. We we issued that, right? Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, in the statement, of course, it calls for uh, cooperation among the United States, South Korea, and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, the South Korean side oh. that they raised concerns about Japan's decision to. Uh, uh, to uh, to restrict exports of uh, related to to, techno of, to technology to South Korea, uh, was that raised? Uh, does the United States have a viewpoint on whether Japan should be uh, mm -hmm. taking that action against the Taiwan? So I'm not going to go beyond the readout in terms of what was presented in the call, but I would say that Japan and South Korea are, of course, uh, not only friends. Their allies um, in the United States, and of course here at the State Department, we're going to do everything we can uh, to pursue ways to strengthen uh, our relationships um, between and, and amongst all three countries, both publicly and behind the scenes. It's an incredibly, uh, both relationships are incredibly important. We all share, uh, face shared regional challenges and priorities in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. Um, and so we will continue to do that, to, to work with both Japan and South Korea, both publicly and privately. Uh, what what type of measures could that be? I mean, for example, ASEAN is coming up. Would, mm -hmm. uh, would a three-way meeting be something that would be on the cards? I'm not going to preview what sort of media that we'll do at ASEAN, but uh, we will, of course, I mean, we're in communication with these countries via our embassies and, of course, via the State Department on a, on a daily basis. These are some of the closest relationships that we have in the world, and we'll continue to work with uh, both with both countries um, to strengthen the relationship between all three of us. And I know you said you're, you're not actually going beyond that, but I mean, mm -hmm. has there been contact with the Japan about their decision to... Uh, I'm not going to go beyond that. Leslie? I just also, I'm going to stick with the South, South Korea thing. South Korea? Okay. Um, was any of that discussion to do with a report out overnight um, uh, from um, outlets, uh, Asian outlets uh, based here, in that the U.S. is considering offering um, 12 to 18 months suspension of certain sanctions mm -hmm. um, against North Korea? Uh, so while we don't preview any sort of sanctions uh, from the podium, whether it's adding new ones or taking them away, uh, I will say that I did actually speak to Steve Began about that, and he categorically uh, denied that. He said that report is completely false. Um, so there's there's no truth to that. Sure. The South Korean representative Kim Chang Jung from our Blue House mm -hmm. has come to meet the U.S. representative yesterday here. Do you have anything on this? How do U.S. help with this? I don't have anything extra on that meeting. I'm sorry. I'll look into that. Does anybody, let's stick with Asia for a little bit, and then we can switch to, yeah. They would like the U.S. to mediate the dispute between Japan and South Korea. Mm -hmm. Is that something the U.S. is considering doing? Um, with all due respect, I just answered three questions from uh, Sean on that subject, and I think that I gave a sufficient answer. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Nakamura, Nikkei, Newspaper in Japan. Uh, let me clarify your comment on North Korea. Uh, in the last briefing, mm -hmm. you said the nuclear freeze would be at the mm -hmm. uh, beginning of the process for denuclearization. Right. Uh, I did does this that. mean the U.S. Uh, would give some benefits to North Korea? once North Korea agrees on the nuclear freeze at the beginning of the process? 
Yeah, I mean, you're just talking about negotiations that we're not going to preview from here. You know, I think I actually gave on Tuesday a pretty lengthy uh, discussion uh, on uh, what Steve Began and Secretary Pompeo and the team are doing. I refer you back to my statements um, on Tuesday. And when we have another update, we'll certainly let you know. Asia or something else? Anyone else on Asia? No? Okay, Iran. Two questions, one on Iran and one on Syria. Uh, on Iran, you've been working on the creation of a new coalition to protect the freedom of uh, navigation in the Gulf. Uh, do mm -hmm. you have any update on this? When do you expect it to be born? No, when we were, not this past trip, but let's see, this past trip when we were in Saudi and UAE, um, I believe that we gave a uh, backgrounder on that, and we can, I don't think anything has changed since that, um, since we gave out that information. If you don't have that, we'll be happy to, to get that we to have you. It. I have it, but you have uh, it. Okay. Uh, there is no update on it. You, no, I'll, I can check with the team and get back to you, see if there's any, anything new that we would share publicly. And on Syria, uh, do mm -hmm. you have any readout uh, on uh, Ambassador Jeffrey's visit to uh, northeastern Syria? and? Do you have any commitment from any uh, country to send troops to uh, to Syria? I don't. Uh, I don't have a readout from any of his um, travel. Uh, let me let me get back to. Is there something specific that you're that you're looking for? I don't think that no, we put out a readout. Ambassador Jeffrey went to Syria and he met with right. the, the Kurds and the other other groups. If there is any readout for. Uh, on his meetings, why he's there, and uh, what did he well, achieve? Well, I think it's obvious why he's there, but no, um, we'll check. I'll check into a readout for you. And if there is any country committed to send troops to to Syria, too. Yeah, I mean, he the the ambassador uh, is obviously working incredibly diligently on uh, on that cause, uh, you know, with many of our European allies, um, as well as this Turkish safe zone, a number of issues. Um, and when he gets back, I'll be happy to have a conversation with him and get back to you on what we can share publicly. Rich, thanks. thanks. Is the administration considering any measures to address China's importation of Iranian oil? Um, I mean, we have said very publicly, the Secretary has said it here from this podium, um, that we're going to zero, and that countries that don't abide by U.S. sanctions um, will uh, face repercussions for not abiding by U.S. sanctions. That goes for China or any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. would conceivably sanction? those imports? We expect all parties, uh, we expect all countries uh, to abide by U.S. sanctions. Uh, we have gone, uh, as the Secretary said here from this podium, and has talked to many of you about it several times, um, we've gone to zero as it relates to that, and we expect every country to abide by that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, does, is it the Secretary's or the State Department's current position that the U.N. Security Council should invoke uh, snapback sanction measures? Um, given uh, that Iran appears to be violating some elements of the JCPOA. Now. What was the start of the question? Is it You said something about the Secretary. The, the Secretary of the State Department's view that, that sanctions should be snapped back under the terms of you know, the Security Council resolutions. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're asking of me would be, again, to, to preview actions that we are, uh, you know, not ready to discuss publicly. I think as it relates to uh, Iran, you know, in general, um, I think that we have been very vocal about our position. We talked about in the in the uh, uh, topper at the beginning about what the the British uh, Navy was able to do in terms of the harassment yesterday. I mean, as you know, the secretary, you've been on some of the trips. The secretary's been all over the world uh, dealing with this issue, talking to our allies. Um, the president um, has said that he will meet with the Iranians uh, without mm -hmm. preconditions. Um, so we seek, seek a diplomatic solution. We have asked our allies many times, we've talked about this from the podium, that we've asked our allies to ask Iran to uh, de-escalate the situation, uh, not harass American allies are our interests, not terrorize the region. Um, I feel like that this is stuff that I've talked about uh, quite a bit about from this podium that you guys are well versed sure. on. I mean, the, the actual notion of the, the formal invocation of, of snapping mm -hmm. back sanctions at the Security Council. Yeah. Uh, when we have any sort of announcements on policy positions that we're going to take, well, you will be the first to know. Yes. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'll let you. You did tell me happy birthday today, so maybe. The Kurdistan regional government announced uh -huh. the formation of its new cabinet yesterday. How do you see that development? Uh, yeah, give me just one second on that. I 
clearly have too big of a book. I have a written statement for you on that. I just can't find it at the moment. So let me get that. Can I get that to you in writing? Do you need it on camera? That's nice if it's on camera. I'm sure people would appreciate it. But if you can't find it, then. Yeah, I know, but I can't find my Iraq tab. I wouldn't read into that. Oh, because it's right in front of me. That's why. Okay, you're ready. It's on camera for you now. We congratulate the Prime Minister and the Kurdistan Regional Government on their successful government formation. We, of course, enjoy a close partnership um, with the Prime Minister and with the Kurdistan Regional Government. We work on important issues, including re regional security, economic reform, and repairing relations between the KRG and the government of Iraq. We are, of course, confident that we will remain a close partner on these priorities moving forward. And I think, Can I have a Can I have a um, let me go to Abby. She hasn't had a chance. Uh, thanks so much. This is sure. on Afghanistan. Um, okay. There was a report out that the U.S. was questioning that elections in Afghanistan would go forward. Uh, does the U.S. believe that they will um, occur as planned in September? And uh, also, Can I, just to clarify on that, because I saw that, so I checked into that right before we came. That was a tweet from a journalist, and I confirmed with our embassy that journalist was not a part of any sort of meeting from our side. And actually, that uh, journalist um, has taken down that tweet. So I don't think that that report is any is timely anymore. Can I have one more question on sure. Afghanistan? Can you provide any update on the latest discussions between U.S. and Taliban? And do you still believe that a, a peace deal will happen by September 1st? Well, I mean, listen, the ambas Ambassador Khalil Azad is working, obviously, in incredibly hard. He's been around the world. I think he has one of the – he and Steve Began have two of the toughest jobs here. Um, but he has made seven, uh, sub substantial progress. I believe we are now in our seventh round of talks um, with the Taliban. Um, the Secretary has said, you know, when, when asked about this, that um, after almost two decades of war in Afghanistan, the hour has come for peace. This is also something that the President has talked about um, uh, quite a bit. And uh, I know that uh, the ambassador was, uh, was or is in China today uh, for a pre-scheduled meeting. Um, but throughout this latest round of Taliban talks, um, which was, you know, the ambassador described it to me when we, when we uh, communicated briefly as being one of the most productive rounds that he's had to date. Um, so when we have anything specific to read out, uh, we certainly will. But this is something that Ambassador Khalil Azad, Secretary Pompeo, and most importantly, the President of the United States takes incredibly seriously after um, almost two decades of our men and women being, women being in Afghanistan. Um, I, this has gone on pretty long, so I will see all of you soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. No, but Matt, I need to tell you one thing. Yes. 